So we're in Ezra 3 um, tonight, the continuation obviously from the um, last couple of, uh, couple of weeks. <coughs> so when I started looking at this, um, kind of thing that jumped out me to, to begin with is we have Israel going back. Israel coming back to the promised land again, um, and it shows that God is is in the business of fixing broken relationships, um, and the relationship with God being restored, because over and over again uh, we see relationship broken. You know, we saw it with Adam and Eve, right in the garden. God had to make sacrifice, and covering was given. Then we see it with Israel over and over again. We see it with Apostle um, Peter, um, even with parables. We see it with um, the prodigal son, you know, him running off, and then God restoring that relationship in that parable. <clears throat> it's not unlike our relationship with him. Um, and again, thankfully, you know, God's a restoring God, and he's our ultimate sacrifice, which allows us to have any type of relationship with him. But sadly, for... The Israelites, they had to go into um, captivity because they were disobedient. So part of um, the Jews went with the Assyrians. The Israel, the, uh, Israel went into captivity, and Nebuchadnezzar took the southern tribes um, and destroyed the temple, laid waste to the temple, and took all the accoutrements and, and service items and everything with him um, when he, when he, when he uh, took it. For if you recall from, um, I was reading Joshua, God had given the Jews the land as the inheritance. Part of that obviously is Jerusalem. They set up a temple there, and it was part of promise. So while they always have that land, they may not always live in the land. The land was contingent upon their obedience. And because they weren't obedient, they got, they got sent into captivity. <clears throat> the good news is that even in captivity, and if we're in ca captivity to this world, um, the good news is we can always be drawn back. God allowed the Israelites to go into captivity, and this was going to be a, an opportunity for their healing and an opportunity for a restoration with him. And frankly, uh, we'll see um, in a second um, that Jerusalem was on their mind, and by being away from it for a while, um, they longed for it which is not a bad thing to long for, for God, to long for the ways of God. And to them, temple, that's what they equated it to. Um, he is always ready for us to return and may even use our poor choices as a tool to do so. Um, how many times have you um, made a poor choice and ran away and... and Maybe that poor choice put you into a situation where the only place you could look was to God because you knew he was the only one that could get you out from under or get you through whatever you picked to put yourself into. Um, sometimes it's the old saying, when you're flat on your back, you can only look up. Thankfully, we can get up flat on our back and it'd be like, oh, go ahead, stand up, come back. So and again... You know, when I was talking about the Israelites longing for Jerusalem again, in Psalm 137, 1 through 4, it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked us a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So they were having trouble even singing in a foreign land. Um, but again, they were remembering. They were remembering Jerusalem. They were remembering their home. They were remembering their time with God, the temple, which you put the ark in there, God dwelt in it. That's, that's where God was. Even when they were, were wandering in the wilderness, they had God with them. <clears throat> so now we get to verse 1. And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. So first thing we'll notice here is it's the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, and this is a, a big feast month. It's September, October in our time frame. We had the Feast of Trumpets, um, 
or Rosh Hashanah, we had the Day of Atonement, and we have Yom Kippur, uh, I'm sorry, um, Feast of Tabernacles. So the Feast of, of Trumpets, you can find information on in, on, in Leviticus 23, 23 through 25. And this feast marks the beginning of the Jewish High Holy Days and the 10 days of repentance. They blew a ram's horn to call the people of God together as they prepared to repent for their sins. The Day of Atonement, Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, this is a celebration of the High Holy Days and it culminates in Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. This was a day that the high priest would make an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. It was the one time each year where the high priest entered into the Holies of Holies, the most inner part <clears throat> chamber in the temple to make atonement on behalf of the people. The act of atonement would bring reconciliation between God and his people. Thankfully for us, with Jesus as our high priest, um, we can enter his presence whenever we want to. Frankly, we can enter his presence and he's right here in our hearts, in our souls, so as the Holy Spirit. Um, he dwells within us um, and we're invited to come to him and to God and repent whenever. We don't have to wait, nor do we need somebody to do it for us. We can do it on our own. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths this is from Leviticus 23, 33 through 43. This was a week-long festival culminating or uh, commemorating the 40 years journey of the Israelites and their wandering in the wilderness. Throughout these holidays, the Jews would build booths and they would dwell on them as they remembered their wandering forefathers in the uh, wilderness. So we see that they're gathered at a very interesting time, and all these feasts are kind of festivals, and it's kind of set up, in this case, as a festival for repentance as they get ready to build the ark. And as we see the, the, um, here in the verse 2 that the people went back to Jerusalem faith. While they got permission from Cyrus to go back, they had to go back in faith because it was perilous times. Um, there were a lot of people, not so unlike today, that would prefer them not to have been there, not to have been there now. Um, but they went back because that was their home and that's, that's where they knew they, they belonged. And then they gathered as one man um, in one accord. While I'm sure they had some differences, who doesn't? They put them aside, gathering in Jerusalem to prepare themselves to fulfill the plan of God. Unity is one of the basic foundations of accomplishing the work of God. Think about what, um, what you can accomplish, just the, the thing we did here on, on Friday, right? It took, it took a lot of people to do things. There were people cooking. There were people setting up in there. Um, you know, the, the people that, that put ads on the radio to get everybody here to hear Dr. Tony Evans. That just doesn't happen with one person. If Tony Evans would have said, hey, I want to talk to all these people, I'll get it done, he would have done it on, him, on his own. It's not happening, right? It takes, <laughs> it takes a village. So, Philippians 2, 1 through 4 speaks to this. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. So as we're Christians, we can have fellowship in the spirit. That helps. Um, we have to have affection, have to have mercy, and we can't have selfish ambition. So we have to throw aside ourselves and not think about ourselves, but think about each other and more importantly, what's our task? What would God have us to do? Because ultimately, why are we here? We're here for his glorification, not for our own self-gratification or glorification. <clears throat> not having a unified vision or front ultimately will keep us individually and as a body from accomplishing all we could from the kingdom of God. How much, as a question, how much can we do as a body 
if we are unified and of like mind and purpose. We should remember to not be sidetracked on purpose and division over silly things. He looked at me funny. He didn't say hi to me. Um, you know, just think of the silly things sometimes, right? That, that um, I know he doesn't like me. He, he doesn't like my outfit, whatever, you know, or, and this is a, a killer, right? In, in some churches, especially when you have new people come in, there could be, and this isn't brothers necessarily, because we don't know if a person coming in is a Christian or not, but, you know, especially if you go to a church that's all dressed up and you're going like this, you're like, I know he's looking at me funny. I know he doesn't think I belong here. And you might not come back. I mean, that's a silly thing, right? Just clothing. But it, it could be anything. And sadly, a lot of big issues are started because of little misunderstandings. Um, I'll just be transparent. I had something with Mike. Um, little tiny thing. He said something, and I heard it wrong. But instead of festering on it, I went to him like four days later and said, hey, brother, you said this what it mean. And hopefully, Mike, you don't mind me using you. And he's like, yeah, he, he heard me wrong. Or I mean, I heard him wrong. And that wasn't what he meant. He was trying to be a goofball. That's not what I heard because I was being sensitive. Now, I could have gone to, <laughs> you, know, you know, I could have, I was being sensitive. Imagine that. So I could have, I could have gone away, licked my wounds, been upset, not talked to him for six weeks. And him think, what did I, what did I do? Blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, he and I aren't friends, right? Or I'm saying something about him behind his, it doesn't make any sense, right? So if there is a conflict or a misunderstanding or something, take a brother, go talk to him. You know, what's going on? Why, you know, it's, it's not worth it at the end of the day. Think about um, what we accomplish if we are of one mind and purpose working for the kingdom of God. I know we've already said that and it was reminded too of a tug of war, right? If you're playing tug of war and there's five on each side, if only one of you is pulling, you're going to lose. If all of you guys are pulling at different times or rowing a boat, right? I'm terrible at rowing a boat, right, or a canoe. I'm always wanting to do this, and everybody else is doing it different or whatever. So, you know, it's like give me both and I'm good. But, um, you know, you, you've got to be in rhythm. You've got you to work at the same pace, at the same rate, doing the same thing. And one of you can't go this way, and one of you be wanting to go that way. If you want to go straight, you've got to get in, you've got to get in line. <clears throat> Verse 2. Then Joshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel to, burn off, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So Jeshua was a high priest, and he was instrumental not just now, but kind of continuing as the story goes and reestablishing the tent, the, uh, the temple and it's all its activities. In other books you'll, of the Bible, you'll see that he's, his spelling is Joshua. So sometimes it's, it can get confusing because some of these books, they're parallel and you see different names like, what the? But that's, that's part of the rub for him. Um, and then later for him in, in verse 4, or in chapter 4, you will see him and Zerubbabel were kind of in charge, and they were asked, hey, can we help with the Samaritans, or the Samaritans want to help? And like, no, nah, we don't think we need your, your assistance. Um, they were probably fearful that it wouldn't go so well. Where was their interest? Uh, Zerubbabel, he was the heir to the throne as a descendant of David, and as such, he was a natural pick for governor. He couldn't be anything more than a governor because the line kind of, it was still going, but it was over for them. And Cyrus and, and everybody said, you're going to get to go there and to be, be the governor. And then you'll find him in Matthew 1, verses 2, or 1, 2, and in Luke 3, 27. You'll see that he's in the ancestral line of Jesus, given that he's of the line of David, which is pretty cool. He's getting to go back and start the, the tabernacle again, get to be governor, and you know, continue the line of, of Jesus. And he was also to have an active part in building the foundation of the temple and reestablishing all the workings of the temple. Um, so they didn't have a temple because it wasn't there, um, obviously, and it had been destroyed. And they didn't try to build the temple first. They wanted to do first things first. And what was the first thing? 
they needed to, to pray, worship God, and build an altar. Because while the temple was in ruins, they needed to begin with building the altar because they needed to pray and worship. And as you noted, they, they started to do that in the, in the morning and at night. The altar is a place of meeting. This is where we meet Jesus, at the altar and at the cross. It is also the place of sacrifice. The altar is a foreshadowing of the, cry, of the cross where the ultimate sacrifice was made, which allows us to have a relationship with, with God and Jesus in the, in the first place. Hebrews 13, 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. It was different then than it is now. John 4, 20 through 21. This is the woman of the well story talking about we're not, you know, we're not really going to need the tabernacle and all the things that went on there because there was going to be a new sheriff in town. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where they, <clears throat> they ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So the <clears throat> altar was the center of daily activity, um, which the rest of, of Israel's worship could take place. It was a center of activity. I mean, that's, that's where they went, you know, and when the temple came and the altar, that's where they went to start their, their festivals. It all started with their right standing with God. The word law translates to the word Torah, and the verb form of this means to shoot or cast down in a straight manner or to direct. The idea here is that God's instruction to Israel through the Torah laid down a straight path to follow. The target, it was a right relationship between God and the people. That's why he gave them the law. That's, you know, he, he wanted, he knew that they needed to do what they needed to do to stay in right standing and be able to stay in Israel or, you know, and have, have a relationship with, with God. And as I was reading this too, I had a squirrel moment because they said, Moses, the man of God, right? They don't need to say Moses, the man of God. We know where it came from. But my squirrel moment is there's Moses listed being called the man of God. And we see that in different books and stuff. And my thought there is, wouldn't it be cool to have something read of us later where it said, you know, such and such and such and such, Jem, the man of God, or replace your name with that. That's kind of a, a, a very cool thing that we see in scripture for him. Then it also reminds me of King David, not that it's in this, but I was reminded of him, a man after God's own heart. Who doesn't want to be a man after God's own heart? When we're dead and gone, somebody looks at our, our tombstone. He was a hard worker. He was a good-looking fella. He always wore shorts. Or do you want to see, you know, he was a man of God, right? Or do you want to see he was a man after God's own heart? Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as a king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. And that kind of jumped out at me when I was reading that. It wasn't he's doing some of my will, he's doing all of my will. And what's kind of interesting, all you guys probably know the story of David, great guy, but he did some really stupid, bad, bad things. But still a man after God's own heart, and it, doesn't, and it still says, he will do my will. Um, that's pretty cool. So in this, what will your legacy be, right? Will you be a man after God's own heart, or will you be known for, will you be known like, like Moses, you know, a man of God, or will you be known for something else? Verse 3, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its basis, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So even in the midst of their enemies, in, <clears throat> in some fear, they worshiped, prayed, and made sacrifice in the morning and the evening. So as I said, they were coming back kind of like now, right? I mean, you have Israel, and then you've got all these people that, that don't like them at all around them. Wasn't much different then. And not only that, but all these, all these different groups of people worship their own gods and sacrifices and it was a, a, a you know kind of a crazy time 
Um, but that's what they were called to do. So, so <clears throat> in the midst of, of this, they were worshiping and, and praying. Um, and the, the restoration and worship, frankly, may have been re- motivated in part by fear, right? If we're afraid, what do we sometimes do? Lord, help me. It's not, well, I'm about to, I'm about to do something that's a little scary. Give me $10, right? I mean, we're not relying on our money at that point. It's help me God, right? So even, even people that don't know Jesus are asking for God's help, right, when things are bad. Um, I think I've told a couple people this. <clears throat> um, I don't think I've said it in here, but before I was a Christian, I still don't like to fly, but um, before I was a Christian, I really didn't like to fly because I did not like the thought of, you know, plummeting 30,000 feet for five minutes and being a smudge, but more important than that is what happened after I was a smudge, and I knew, or I thought I knew, that, you know, I was going to not be with with God, I was going to be visiting Satan, so I would white knuckle and I would pray until the plane got level, because once it got level and started like 10,000 feet when you hear the ding, it's because my uncle used to work for the FAA, right, and he's like, when you level off and you hear the ding, you're pretty good, so I would would white knuckle until I heard the ding, and then when we got to 30 and we were flat, I was good. Descent, landing, wasn't too big of a deal. I didn't mind that, but takeoff. And so after I was a Christian, I was flying somewhere for, um, for work, and I still didn't like it, but I didn't white knuckle. And I, I said one prayer as opposed to, you know, pray without ceasing, which I did before I was, before I was saved. So that's what, helped me, that's what helped me know. But again, not a Christian. I'm like, Lord, please help me. God, please save me. Lord, you, you know, I know I, you know, anyway, you get the drill. So I'd only have to just only scream for two minutes. And probably if it's going down fast enough, right, you'd probably pass out anyway, so it would have been all good. So um, again, while we're call- and so in that, while we're called not to be anxious or afraid, God can still use our fears, right, to um, as a way of drawing us closer, as he can use other things. Philippians 4 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. So um, take, your, take your thoughts, take your fears, um, go to the altar, um, bring God into the equation, because only in that are, are, are your ways going to, to work out. As we know, too, the, the altar was a, a place for blood sacrifice. This is where we acknowledge our sin with the understanding that only a blood sacrifice can cover our sins. Ultimately, our hope and our trust is in him. Psalm 91, 2. Will you, say, <clears throat> will you say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. This should be an example to us, and we should make time to pray, study, and meditate <clears throat> on and with him, which is exactly what they were trying to do. Again, they weren't worried about the temple because the temple is not... You know, it's where they worship, but it's ultimately not what they needed to worship. They needed their altar. So we need to be diligent. Verse 4. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for the new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated. And these, everyone and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will, free will offering to the Lord. So God gives us certain instructions we are to follow, like the tithe, tithe is an ordinance. He requires us to do other things. Um, but as you, as you see here, um, they also gave willingly offerings. You know, we can have offerings of service, right? So... Um, So we just need to be diligent in what, what God's commanding us to do. Verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, 
although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been, been laid. So as we kind of talked about, they didn't need a temple to worship. They didn't need a temple to repent. They didn't need a temple um, to enjoy um, time communing with God. You can have an altar without a temple, but you can't have a temple without an altar. This is even truer still. Um, this is uh, truer. Um, this was true then and even truer now. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. <clears throat> or do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For we were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, is our, which are God's. So for them, the first works were to pray and to worship God, not start building the temple. They had been preparing their hearts for the service of building the temple. Our worship and prayer, the relationship, if, if you will, is more important than our service. If your service is not an act of worship, then your service means little. And that comes with attitude as well, right? Because if you're doing service and you're grumbling and you're not happy with what you're doing, um, I don't know that we're going to necessarily be rewarded for that, right? We need to do things with... Uh, with a, a, a pure heart and for, um, for right reasons. It's kind of reminded me of, uh, you know, people come in, right? The service and, and what we do and how, we, how, how things are services, right? We have, um, oh golly, my brain just left me. Sparkle here, right? So. We have a pastor who gets up there on their stage and they knock it out, but whoever's coming in here, if they had seen our place and it's filthy, they're probably not going to remember too much from stage. They're going to remember what they saw in the bathroom. And, you know, so we get to be a part of, of, of that. So let's realize that we're doing tasks for God and be and worship him with our service with a, with a good heart. So remembering to this point, they still haven't done any work on rebuilding the, t the temple. Um, because they were choosing wisely, right? They're, they're, they're wanting to be right with God, have a relationship with God, and they'll work, worry about the temple later, which, you know, um, kind of goes to a story with Mary and Martha, right? The relationship should always come first because it's the most important. And we have in Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now what happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus, or who, who also sat at Jesus' feet, or sat at, at Jesus' feet and heard his, <clears throat> heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much and approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone, therefore tell her to help. And Jesus answered and said to Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. What did she choose? She chose to sit at Jesus' feet and have a relationship, while Martha decided to not have a relationship and sweat in the kitchen. So again, is sweating in the kitchen good? Yeah, but what's better? So, and then um, in Ephesus, right, where we see in Revelation 2, 4 through 5, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you and quickly, come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So again, we're to repent and do what is first, and in this, go back to your first love, um, if you've run from God for a bit or go to your first love the first time if you've not done it before. Verse 7. They have also, they also gave money 
to the masons and the carpenters in food, drink, and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the permissions which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So they had been preparing, and it was prepared for, for them to build and to work on the temple. People that gave, that's an act of worship. They had permission from Cyrus the king. Um, who would have thought that a, a pagan king, right, would have said, yeah, go back, build the temple, worship your own god. So, um, but as we know, kings and government are placed and appointed by God. They're not their, they're not their own. Romans 13.1 says, let every soul be subject to um, governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Why was this important? Why was it important for Israel to have a temple? Temple in Hebrew translates to our word for palace. This is fitting as the temple was the place for the king, the Lord of hosts, who rules over his covenant people. Sacrifice at this site of the temple revealed submission of the exiles to their king. So this was them coming back, uh, coming back to God. Our hearts are now the altar where sacrifices are made to him. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, God to, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16, Therefore by him let us continually offer the offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifice God is pleased. And then in 1 Peter 2, 5, you also as a living stone are being built up for a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So again, um, They were in exile and kind of realized the error of their ways. God prepared them, frankly, to run back home and get right. And again, they didn't build a temple. They got right first. Temple would come later and next week. You know, we'll talk about how they actually built the temple. But right now, everything was a preparation for that. Um, you know, we kind of do that here, right? You know, people come to the church and join, whether they're Christians or not. You know, they, they, they become Christians or whatever. We want them to have a relationship here with this body, make sure it's their home, you know, get, 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 get the word um, and be raring to go there. And then after, you know, if it's 30 days now or 60 days now, then it's like, okay, release the hounds and now you can, can serve. But even here, we understand it's not about service, it's about relationship and let's get that right first because then you can build on that. If you're just building on service at some point you'll be like this stinks and you'll you'll run from from that probably. <laughs>